I always, I've been trying to recommend movies. Uh, uh, the best I can come up with at the moment for Macbeth is the one starring Ian McKellen, soon to be appearing in The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey. Uh, 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 he plays Macbeth, Judy Dench plays Lady Macbeth. It's a decent enough production, it won't ruin it for you. It's not all that good, frankly, but I'm gonna, Roman Polanski directed a version of it, which I, I need to review before I can uh, recommend it. It's, it's very powerful in certain ways, but it, it's kind of like a Roman Polanski horror movie based on Macbeth. So let me, I'll watch that over Thanksgiving and then let you know. There's a whole other bunches of Macbeth, but those are the only two ones I own on DVD. Uh, and I has, there's one with Patrick Stewart, uh, doesn't sound very good to me from the descriptions, but again, Patrick Stewart's a great actor. But anyway, I always like you to be able to see uh, these things as plays, and the one with Mc McKellen and, and Dent certainly isn't anything quite to sneeze at. Uh, okay, I think that's all the business. Uh, 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 so, uh, we turn now to what's famously known as the Scottish play. Uh, Macbeth is supposed to be cursed in the theater, and Actors don't mention it, it's bad luck to say Macbeth, so they say the Scottish play. There's even an episode of The Simpsons uh, where that comes up. Uh, and uh, indeed, we are going to look at it as a Scottish play. This is going to be a kind of lesson in uh, geography uh, today, as you can see from the board. Now, uh, this is an interesting example of how people try to find contemporary meaning in the play. Here's a play that uh, probably came out around 1606, 1607. That is not long after James VI of Scotland became James I of England. And so uh, this is one of those plays that people tie in to the court of uh, James I. Uh, it's supposed to be a play that Shakespeare wrote in order to flatter uh, James I and get in with his good graces. James had, in fact, become the royal patron of Shakespeare's theater company, which went from being the Lord Chamberlain's men uh, to the King's men. Uh, and uh, 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 James thought of himself as descended from Banquo. Uh, this has since been disproven, but at the time, the Stuart line was said to have uh, uh, descended from Banquo, and so this is supposedly Shakespeare's way of paying a compliment to King James. Now, I have to say that <laughs> uh, if this is Shakespeare's way of paying a compliment, I'd hate to see what he wanted to do if he was nasty. Uh, because uh, if I were a king, I sure wouldn't want to be presented as being descended from these Scottish savages. We have someone from Scotland in this class, so I don't want to go too heavy on this. But you do see a very strong reflection of English prejudices against the Scottish uh, in this uh, play. The Scottish are basically presented as barbarians, uh, and the English held up as a model of civilization. So I, have, I find it very hard to see this as a way of flattering James. Uh, and for that matter, to say you're descended from someone named Fleance. I mean, who wants to be descended from someone named Fleance? Come on now. Uh, and we'll see that the portrait of Banquo is not quite as positive as many people uh, uh, think it is. So uh, I, I'm very skeptical of the idea that this play was uh, meant to uh, praise King James. And, uh, and indeed, it's amazing that Shakespeare got away with this play, considering that several of his contemporaries ended up in jail for writing comedies where people spoke with heavy Scottish accents, including Ben Jonson. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm going to treat the play in connection with Hamlet and Othello uh, and try to show you how these three plays work together and where I'm going to use uh, Macbeth uh, to reinforce what I was trying to show you in Hamlet and Othello. That is, I think, once again here, Shakespeare is exploring the great fault line of Renaissance culture, the tension between uh, classical and Christian values, and that what he's doing here, much as he did in Othello, is show us a pagan warrior who is confronted with Christianity and disturbed by it, perturbed by it, indeed ultimately unhinged uh, by it. Uh, there's some remarkable passages in this 
play that we'll come back to, but I want to start off with. If you turn to page 43, uh, which is Act 3, uh, Scene 1, this is the scene uh, when Macbeth is... Are we getting feedback there? Or is that some... Oh, something outside. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, 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 this is Act 3, Scene 1, line 85 on page 43 of the Signet. This is when Macbeth is confronting the uh, murderers, uh, and he's trying to get them to kill Banquo. He's evidently prepped them for it by telling them Banquo uh, had worked behind their, their backs against them. So, line 86, do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel that you can let this go? That are you so gospel to pray for the, this good man and for his issue? Are you so gospel? That's actually a remarkable word there that Shakespeare seems to have coined. Uh, uh, gospel is a verb there. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, this is the first appearance of this word in print, at least. So here's something. Shakespeare has Macbeth noting that the people in Scotland have been gospel. They've been Christianized, uh, and it's made them tame. It's given them all this patience, just as Christianity should be. And so they now don't have that thumas anymore. Uh, they're not eager enough to take revenge. And indeed, what the murderer says to this response, he asks, are you gospel? And he says, no, we're men. <laughs> we're not Christians, we're men. It's really quite extraordinary. We'll come back to this passage later to the, what the definition of a man is here. But there's this strong sense here of the opposition be, between being gospel and having manliness. And then even more remarkably on page 53, uh, uh, after Banquo has been murdered, uh, and Macbeth is confronted with what he believes to be Banquo's ghost. Uh, at this party. So this is page 53, Act 3, Scene 4, about line 75. Blood, Macbeth says, blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere humane statute purged the gentle wheel. I and since two murders have been, been performed too terrible for the ear. He's talking about the olden time here, and what's that time? It's the time before humane statute purge the general wheel. It's the time before Christianity. It's the time before uh, the, the humaneness of Christianity came to prevail in barbaric Scotland. The olden time ere humane statute purged the general wheel. And what was that time like? The times has been that when the brains were out, the man would die. And they are an end. But now they rise again. <laughs> Here we are in the Christian world. And we now have the possibility of resurrection. Uh, and it just baffles Macbeth. You know, they used, they used to be, the good old days, you killed a guy and he stayed dead. It was so easy. Now we've been gospeled and we got humane statues, statues, statutes, and they come back. Now they rise again with 20 mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. Now this is what I'm focusing on here. What I'm talking about when I'm saying that Shakespeare here portrays a pagan hero uh, who is confronted with this Christian world, how new it is, I can't tell you, but, but Macbeth is still asking of certain people, are you gospel? As if, you know, have you guys become Christians? There's a lot of Christians around suddenly. Uh, are you some of them? Because we may have a problem with killing Banquo if you guys have gone all Christian on me uh, at this moment. Uh, you really see this sense of the pagan warrior that his world has changed around him, and it's so much more uh, confusing uh, now. And it is deeply confusing and puzzling to him. Now, this will help explain... Uh, sort of the whole tenor of Macbeth that makes it unusual even among Shakespeare's tragedies. Uh, that is, Shakespeare, uh, uh, Macbeth is a very problematic hero. It's very difficult to speak about him as a hero. You want to say he's a villain. He's a tyrant. Uh, this is the same kind of figure that appears as Richard III, uh, famously in one of Shakespeare's earliest plays. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, we know that these are tragic heroes in Shakespeare, but still we, we feel pretty comfortable calling King Lear a hero and Hamlet a hero and Coriolanus and Antony and Judas Caesar and um, even Othello, he does a terrible thing uh, killing Desdemona, but it's in response to Iago's uh, machinations and we, we still, noble Othello goes well with us. Uh, uh, when you think about it, uh, Macbeth is, sh uh, is Shakespeare's most extreme case of a tragic hero in the sense he's really pushing the limits here of villainy, uh, where the tragic hero slips into villainy, and you want to say he's just evil. But if you go to the beginning of the play, you'll see things aren't that way. He is brave Macbeth at the beginning of this play. Uh, because he is the standard image of the pagan hero. This is back on page four, and this is how we are introduced to him, namely in battle. And we see him as a Homeric hero, uh, uh, the kind of hero we're quite familiar with from Coriolanus. So this is page four, so act one, scene two. About line nine, the merciless, we're getting reports from the battlefield. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel for that, the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and Gallglasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Not evil Macbeth, not villainous Macbeth, brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with a brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution like Valor's minion. Remember? Beginning of this class, Valor is the chiefest virtue in the Homeric heroic world. Uh, like Valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. This is brave Macbeth. He cuts a guy in half and sticks his head up on a pole. Sounds pretty savage to me, but now... That's fine. And what does the king say? Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. <laughs> oh, you're such a gentleman. You cut a guy in half and stuck his head up on a pole. And you do have to understand, gentleman was a stronger word than gentleman noble. It's like saying a worthy nobleman. But there's already in Shakespeare's day, there's some sense, the modern sense of gentleman. It is so weird uh, that he's being be called a gentleman for here. Uh, and indeed, uh, they now face some other uh, powers from uh, Norway and uh, uh, line 35, uh, dismayed not this, our captains, back, 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 Beth and Bankwell. Yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. Uh, remember these comparisons from Coriolanus where you compared ordinary people to tame animals and the great hero to the wild animals, sparrows versus eagles, hares versus lions. This is straight out of Homer, by the way. In the Iliad, this is the way Homer sets up the difference between his heroes and ordinary human beings. So again, this is all part of the Homeric image here, the hero. Uh, uh, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha. Wow. <laughs> uh, Golgotha is where Jesus was crucified. Uh, uh, you might see this as a Christian passage, but it seems to me more likely to view it as an anti-Christian passage because what they're doing is creating another Golgotha here, uh, as in, like the Romans executed Jesus, and now here uh, Macbeth and Banquo were taking care uh, of uh, uh, the rebels. So I want you to see that at the beginning of the play, Macbeth gets praised as a hero for murdering people. Uh, of course, at the end of the play, uh, things uh, are very, very different. If you turn to page 97, this is the very end, Act 5, Scene 8, uh, about line uh, 68, uh, uh, of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen. I want you to get as strong a sense as possible of this contrast. Macbeth virtually in the opening scene, Macbeth in the last scene. In the last scene, he's a dead butcher. In this scene, too, he's a live butcher. 
In, in this scene, he's cutting a guy in half and everyone's praising for him. You know, Macbeth doesn't do this, but I could kind of imagine him in the second half of the play saying, you know, you were praising me for cutting McDonald in half and now you're all bent out of shape because I stuck a dagger in Duncan. You know, I mean, what's the difference? You know, we're Scottish. We kill people. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, uh, and I want you to see that, that this is what I mean, you know, uh, Coriolanus gets praised consistently for doing the stuff that, that, uh, uh, that uh, Macbeth does. Homeric heroes get praised for this stuff. That's what they do. Uh, uh, now, of course, you have that turning inward here. The problem we've seen again and again, what happens to the warrior when he doesn't shift gears in domestic policy. Obviously, the point is you're supposed to kill the traitor McDonald. You're not supposed to kill your legitimate king. But you know, it's kind of hard to turn it on and turn it off. Henry V could do it. Uh, he could go from the lamb to the tiger back and forth. But we've seen the problem with these Shakespearean heroes is that they can't do that. Uh, it's not so easy for them to do that, most of them, and especially the tragic heroes, that's why they're tragic. Uh, and in a way, there's a tragedy here is that Macbeth is caught between antithetical realms of value, and the very qualities that make him heroic on the battlefield turned him into a, 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 a butcher, into a fiend, uh, when those powers are manifest in domestic life. So once again, we're in a world of clashing values. Turn to page 70. Uh, this is Act 4, Scene 3. Very poignant lines from Lady Macduff, about line uh, 70, on page 70, Act 4, three, uh, Act 4, Scene 2, excuse me, Act 4, Scene 2, uh, uh, about line 70. Whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable, to do good sometime accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, did I put up that womanly defense to say I've done no harm? This is like that moment uh, between Shylock and Bassanio over the word good, the question whether Antonio is a good man. And we learn that Shylock and Bassanio were functioning with two different definitions of the word good, one meaning financially sound, the other being morally good. Uh, here, too, we've got two different meanings of good. Uh, I am in this, er this is a very Christian statement here. Uh, I remember now that I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. Yeah, we saw that in the second scene. Cutting people in half is lauded in the second scene. Uh, Christians, not so happy about that. Uh, and indeed, to do good sometime account a dangerous folly. Again and again, these plays turn on different conceptions of the good. Uh, uh, the Conan the Barbarian definition, well, you know, what is good uh, to slay your enemies before you and hear the lamentation of their women. Uh, uh, or this Christian notion of good, uh, which is to do no harm. Uh, uh, I think Shakespeare hit upon this subject. Uh, and I think his eyes must have, must have lit up uh, when he started reading his source um, uh, here uh, uh, because he realized that he could play out in Scotland what he'd been doing in Hamlet Macbeth. And I offer you these geographies uh, here uh, to try to show you how the three plays work together. What we've been seeing is that in these plays, Shakespeare finds a borderland between civilizations, a borderland between a pagan world and a Christian world. And he focuses on the intersection where the characters are divided. So that in Hamlet, uh, we saw Norway to the north, land of Fort Brass, land of epic combat, Denmark in the center, sophisticated Christian Europe to the south, Paris, the land of fashions, courtliness and tennis, Wittenberg, uh, the land of the university, and uh, uh, Protestant uh, Martin Luther, uh, and Hamlet smack in the middle and divided between the pagan and the Christian world. He is a Christian given a pagan task of revenge. Othello, uh, we got Cyprus 
in between Venice and Turkey, uh, Venice the world of Christianity, Turkey the land of Islam and uh, uh, therefore pagan from the Christian perspective, Cyprus smack in the middle, uh, uh, Othello the Turk turned Christian uh, who eventually reveals his inner Turk in the terms of the play uh, and indeed in the end of the play uh, as a Christian slays himself as a Turk. Okay, so now, a similar geography in Macbeth, very strongly developed. To the north of the play are Ireland and Norway, and they are presented as uh, uh, purely pagan and really barbaric. To the south is England, and it's strongly Christian. And Scotland, again, is the borderland. Uh, it's in the middle of the two worlds. Let me show you how that plays out in terms of the uh, 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 text of the play. Uh, that is, if you turn to page four, uh, back to those uh, passages I was just reading. Uh, this is so Act 1, Scene 2. Uh, where are these rebel forces coming from? Well, they're coming from the Western Isles, uh, the Hebrides, uh, and they're kerns and gallo glasses. Uh, and as your notes point out, uh, these terms refer to lightly armed Irish foot soldiers and heavily armed ones. Uh, these are... <laughs> Uh, obviously, uh, uh, antique terms uh, here. Uh, in Shakespeare's day, Kearns would have been recognizable. People were still worried, you know, they were fighting in Ireland, and these are the kind of soldiers uh, they faced here. Uh, so we've got these Irish soldiers uh, with these kind of archaic uh, military terms associated with them. And then on page five, uh, uh, we see the Norwegian lord. Line 31. Again, Norway seems to be a source of Vikings. I mean, we know this in his. I mean, uh, when people still in Shakespeare's day pictured where the most barbaric people come from, well, they come from Norway. And we see that even on page six, uh, where Scotland's also being invaded uh, by the Norwegian ban banners. This is still Act 1, Scene 2, about line 50. Norway himself. Uh, 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 with terrible numbers, uh, 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 along with the disloyal tra uh, uh, traitor, the uh, 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 Thane of Quarter. So we've got uh, a sense here, the forces that need to be suppressed are from the North. And again, for centuries, Europe had lived in dread of the Norsemen, uh, who swept down from uh, what we now call Scandinavia and their Viking boats and uh, uh, raped and pillaged. Uh, even in Capital One ads now, we still have that image uh, uh, going. Uh, England is the very opposite of this. Page 59. Uh, so this is Act 3, Scene 6. Uh, 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 when we first hear about the English court in any detail. So Act 3, Scene 6. Page 59, about line 24. The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court and is received of the most pious Edward, with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his highest respect. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and Warlock Seward, that by the help of these with him above to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, uh, sleep to our nights. So this is Edward the Confessor, one of the most pious kings uh, in the history uh, of, uh, of England. And just, you know, the most pious Edward. He is the holy king. Uh, later we learn on page 76 uh, how deep this goes. He can practice miracles. Page 76, Act 4, Scene 3, uh, about line 140. Uh, uh, that stay is cure of their malady convinces the greatest stay of art. But at his touch, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand, they presently amend. This is the king's touch. Uh, he can cure the king's evil. Uh, as your note says, scrofula called the king's evil because it could allegedly be cured by the king's touch. Uh, and we get this long passage uh, that emphasizes the sanctity and the Christianity of the English king. 
uh, about line 144. It is called the evil, a most miraculous work in this good king, which often since my here remain in England, I have seen him do. How he solicits heaven himself best knows, but strangely visited people, all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye, the mere despair of surgery he cures, hang a golden stamp about their necks, put on with holy prayers, and to spoken to the succeeding royalty, he leaves the healing benediction. With this strange virtue, he hath a heavenly gift of prophecy, and sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace. Once again, this play geographically lays out what I'm calling the tension in the Renaissance between pagan or classical values and Christian values. You can just map it. To the north, again, is the pagan world. To the south is the Christian world. And, and, and... <laughs> And Scotland's trying to make it to England <laughs> here. It's trying to become Christian. Uh, and Shakespeare has a beautiful map on which to play out this tension uh, that he sees so basic. That's why I think these three plays really do work together. Uh, I'm not calling them a trilogy. You know, Coriolanus, Judas Caesar, and Anne and Cleopatra, I think, really are a trilogy, and we can regard them as such, and I'm not the only person that views them as such. I'm not calling Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth a trilogy in that sense. One could almost call them the Christian plays as opposed to their own plays, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I do want you to see they have a lot in common, these three plays. Uh, my biggest regret in this class is I'm not doing King Lear because I don't think it fits into this pattern. I, uh, it's interesting. And it usually, usually these three plays are classed with King Lear as Shakespeare's four greatest tragedies ever since A.C. Bradley's book. That's been the approach. And in terms of quality, there's a lot to be said for that. But I really do think they're quite separate from King Lear, which is set in a pre-Christian era and therefore doesn't involve this particular set of themes that I think holds Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth together. If you'll think about those maps uh, uh, and you're the first people on earth to ever have seen them all together that way, uh, 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 I think you'll see how these plays do hang together. Uh, uh, now, Shakespeare found a lot in his source to be able to pursue this. Uh, 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 and again, we have this miracle of Shakespeare <laughs> transforming his sources, uh, though always beginning with something in them. And so uh, his, uh, one of his principal sources was Holland's Head's Chronicles. Uh, uh, and if you'll turn to page 107, if you have the signet, uh, I think you'll see a passage that uh, 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 caught Shakespeare's eye. Uh, 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 where it says Macbeth's history. So this last paragraph on page 107. Dewada was married unto Sino the Thane of Gloms, by whom she had issue on Macbeth, a valiant gentleman, there's the word again, and one that if he had not been somewhat cruel of nature, might have been thought most worthy the government of a realm. And indeed Shakespeare found in the source in this Scottish history, a lot of admiration for Macbeth. On the other part, Duncan was so soft and gentle of nature that the people wished the inclinations and manners of these two cousins to have been so tempered and interchangeably bestowed betwixt them, that where the one had too much of clemency, that's Duncan, and the other of cruelty, that's Macbeth, the mean virtue betwixt these two extremities might have reigned by indifferent partition in them both, so should Duncan have proved a worthy king and Macbeth an excellent captain. I, uh, this had to catch Shakespeare's eye. It's Scottish Aristotelianism. It's presenting virtue as the mean between extremes here, uh, and they are extremes we've been seeing, clemency and cruelty. It's exactly the way Shakespeare presented Henry V as the man who could combine clemency and cruelty. Uh, uh, here's talk of just that synthesis of antithetical virtues that I've been saying was at the heart of the Renaissance hope that it could bring about a synthesis of classical and Christian values. To th synthesize clemency and cruelty would be to achieve that Renaissance hope uh, of bringing together 
the classical and the Christian. By the way, Nietzsche had a formulation for this in his notes, which was the Roman Caesar with the soul of Christ. <laughs> and again, I, Shakespeare did not read Nietzsche, uh, but uh, that's a very pregnant phrase for understanding what Shakespeare is pursuing. And he plays the question, can you get the Roman Caesar with the soul of Christ, or do you get some strangely unhinged uh, uh, confluence uh, of the two traditions that uh, creates some kind of monster here like uh, Macbeth. It's interesting that this notion of combining antithetical virtues comes up at least twice within Macbeth. If you turn to page 35, uh, uh, this is Act 2, Scene 3, uh, about line 110. Here Macbeth raises the possibility, it's going to be an excuse for why he rubbed out the, uh, uh, the guards of uh, Duncan to blame them for the murder. But he says, this is again line 109, um, who can be wise, amazed, temperate, and furious, loyal, and a neutral in a moment? No man. In a way, that's the whole problem of Macbeth. Hollinshead says, who can have clemency and cruelty or some mean between the two, who can be a, a temperate and furious? Now again, Henry V was temperate and furious. Uh, uh, he, was, he had kindness and valor both, uh, but that was very unusual. And here again, on page 74, so this is Act 4, Scene 3, about line 90, Malcolm is discussing what are the... Uh, kingly virtues, and it's a long list, but I'll just point to two principal words in the list, mercy and courage, which again is clemency and in effect cruelty. I mean, uh, patience and fortitude. Uh, 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 you, you see uh, Shakespeare's sense that the comprehensive king would have to be like Henry V and uh, create an amazing combination of values that are normally at odds with each other. And Shakespeare's tragedies precipitate out of that hope for a synthesis, an ethical synthesis, that turns out to be unworkable in most ordinary human cases. Very difficult to combine clemency and cruelty uh, at the same time. Uh, so let's talk about Duncan first and then turn to Macbeth, because in some ways this is the tragedy of Duncan as, as well uh, here, uh, uh, because in this formula, uh, uh, he represents a certain virtue. Uh, uh, he represents the Christian virtues, uh, or clemency. Uh, the pr but that creates a problem in his world. Just continuing on the bottom of 107, uh, uh, the very last lines on 107, if you've got the signet. The beginning of Duncan's reign was very quiet and peaceable without any notable trouble. But after it was perceived how negligent he was in punishing offenders, many unmisruled persons took occasion, therefore, to trouble the peace and quiet state of the Commonwealth by seditious commotions, which first had their beginnings in this wise. So Duncan is a possibility we've been looking at in this course, namely the fully Christian king who is too Christian to exercise the kinds of cruelty you sometimes need to do in politics. Uh, and indeed, Shakespeare goes out of his way uh, to create that portrait uh, of Duncan uh, in the play. Uh, uh, the, this McKellen movie does a very good job with Duncan. I'll recommend it if for no other reason than this. But think about the opening line this is page four, act one, scene two, first words from Duncan. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt the new estate. Uh, now Duncan has very few lines here, but they're very telling. Because what they show is he's not a battle king. Uh, he's not a field commander. Uh, he needs reports to know what's happening in the battle. Uh, uh, now, we can understand this. I can certainly understand it. You don't see me rushing off to too many battles. But think about the rulers we've been seeing, Coriolanus, uh, even Brutus and Cassius, 
Mark Antony, Oct uh, Octavius got criticized because he won more in his lieutenants than in his person. Uh, generally speaking, we've been seeing here that the ruler is a guy who leads his own troops into battle. Now, again, this is not something <laughs> uh, that we're used to in this country. Uh, uh, we used to let them lead the troops in the battle and then elect them president. <laughs> uh, 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 but, but this was a long-standing human principle that the great king led his troops into battle. Uh, we certainly saw with Henry V, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, the great rulers were men who risked their lives in battle and didn't stand around waiting to hear what happened. I mean, uh, the, the, this McKellen film, uh, Duncan is all dressed in white. I forget if he's wearing a cross or not, but uh, uh, he, he looks very Christian, and he's old, and he stands out among all these bloody men. And, you know, you could take the Monty Python route uh, here uh, with Duncan and sort of, well, what bloody man is that? You know, you know, like he's scared. He's never seen blood before. You know, how dare you bring blood into the royal quarter? You're getting blood all over my nice white robe. But it's an amazing open line. Like, you mean there's blood in battles? I've got to go see one someday myself here. Now, I, I, I'm exaggerating this so you can see the effect here. Uh, but... Uh, but you know, he can report a seameth by his plight. <laughs> Guys bleeding all over the place. And, and, and Duncan, since he's not going to find out the battle any other way, he's got to ask. And then the line I already read on the top of page five, uh, O valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. <laughs> Uh, he better have a valiant cousin because he doesn't seem so valiant himself. And then, again, you know, you just, these lines just go by you, but look at them. Line 35, dismayed not this our captain's Banquo, Macbeth and Banquo. Those are the words of a coward. Uh, Gee, weren't they afraid when a guy from Norway showed up? A Viking? Uh, he'd have been really scared. Uh, and, you know, yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hair of the lion. Uh, you know, again, I don't, I'm not saying this is a, a, a reproach here, but it, it could function as one, you know. Uh, the first thing Duncan thinks of is, I'm frightened of Vikings. Uh, uh, and so he's very, he's very lucky that he has Macbeth, and for that matter, uh, Banquo, and for that matter, uh, Macduff. Uh, there's actually, if you turn to page six, uh, uh, there's quite a dispute over this passage, uh, round line 50, uh, whence comes that worthy thing from Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the thane of quarter, began a dismal conflict till that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude the victory fell on us. There's, a, there's quite a debate over who Bologna's bridegroom is, whether it's uh, Macduff or Macbeth. Uh, for example, in the film, they <laughs> have made the decision, and they say at this point, uh, uh, till that Bologna's bridegroom, brave Macbeth. They add those two words to resolve it. Uh, no one has, uh, has been able to figure this out. I will say, I, I, I lean towards the idea that this is Macduff. Macduff is the Thane of Fife. These reports are coming from Fife. Uh, uh, if this is Macbeth, why one scene later does he not know that the Thane of Corder is dead and a traitor? Uh, 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 he, uh, uh, he, he says on the bottom of page nine, uh, uh, but how of Corder? The Thane of Corder lives a prosperous gentleman. If he just fought him in a battle and defeated him, it's very unlikely that Macbeth would refer to the Thane of Quarter as a prosperous gentleman. Uh, I mention this because, uh, again, it fills out our sense at the beginning of this play of what Scotland's life. Uh, it's filled with Thanes. Now, Thane uh, is a good old Anglo-Saxon word. Uh, uh, they're a form of nobility, but distinctly feudal nobility, F-E-U-D-A-L. Uh, that is, thanes are in a system uh, where 
the king is first among equals, and indeed the thanes choose the king. And we are in an elective monarchy here, because uh, we will see in a minute that Duncan nominates uh, Malcolm as the next king. Uh, uh, and when uh, Duncan's killed, Macbeth is chosen king by the thanes. Uh, uh, this is a world where in the first uh, second scene, uh, uh, we see these Homeric heroes that are thanes, Banquo, Macbeth, and I'm saying Macduff. And notice <laughs> uh, Bologna's bi bridegroom, that associates him uh, with the ancient world. Uh, Bologna is not a Christian figure, as uh, a Roman god, goddess of war. Uh, and notice point against point, rebellious arm against arm. That's really strange because it almost sounds like rebellious arm against rebellious arm. Uh, point here is that what we've got here, these thanes, uh, they're rebellious. They're spirited. These are guys full of thumos. Uh, it's actually hard to tell who's good and who's bad among them. If you look at the bottom of 13, uh, we learn that uh, the evil, traitorous Thane of Quarter had a decent death. Uh, this is Act 1, Scene 4, Line 5, that, uh, that he very frankly, he confesses treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle. There's something Christian about that because he's repenting. There's something though also classical about it because he's dying the way we've seen all those Romans die. Uh, uh, so what we've got here is a volatile situation uh, where you've got all these field warriors. Again, at a minimum, Macbeth, Banquo, and Macduff, uh, and a very weak king. Uh, and a weak king uh, precisely because uh, he's so Christian. He's so meek. Page 21, uh, Macbeth says of him, uh, this is Act 1, Scene 7, line 15, besides this, Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek. And again, Shakespeare is getting this from Holland's head uh, and his chronicle, and the chronicle is setting it up that this is the problem uh, with the... Um, uh, uh, Duncan, and we see it on page 5, uh, excuse me, page 14, uh, when uh, this, so this Act 1, Scene 4, about line 10, uh, when the king is reflecting on <coughs> the death of the faint of quarter, uh, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Enter Macbeth. One of those great stage directions in Shakespeare. Uh, this one probably is authentic. That is, you see here the problem with Duncan is absolute trust, uh, which goes with the meekness. It goes with what Holland's head calls his clemency. Uh, uh, the man is just too trusting, uh, and especially too trusting in a world, <coughs> a volatile world of all these ambitious thanes who are such great warriors. And so he has just <coughs> nearly been... Uh, toppled uh, by uh, putting too much trust in the Thane of Quarter and enter Macbeth. <laughs> Just, uh, 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 and, and Duncan is going to transfer uh, his uh, uh, trust now to Macbeth. O worthiest cousin, line 15, the sin of my ingratitude even now is heavy on me. Uh, and this is, of course, his problem. Uh, as a non-fighting king, he's over-reliant on these great generals, these thanes. This is something Machiavelli would point to in a minute. Uh, uh, <laughs> Duncan should be wiping out these thanes uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, line 18, would thou hadst less deserved. <laughs> Indeed, this is his problem. That would, thou, would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all I can pay. And that turns out to be really true from Macbeth's point of view. Uh, 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 Macbeth is going to think, I didn't get enough here. 
There would be no Duncan today if it weren't for me. Why am I not king? Uh, and notice the compounding of the problem, line 26. Uh, uh, Welcome hither, I have begun to plant thee, and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done. So let me unfold thee and hold thee to my heart. And Banquo is saying, where's my new thing? Uh, now we're going to look at Banquo next time to see a little suspicious aspect to him. But you see here the problem of this kind of system, uh, which Shakespeare had explored in his English history plays. It's really difficult for a king to monitor this kind of situation, especially if he himself is weak. Shakespeare had portrayed this in uh, uh, his uh, 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 um, Henry VI plays, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, 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 the, the king is crucially dependent on these things, and he, he can't give them enough to reward them because he can't give them the kingship and still be king. And then Duncan compounds everything by the fatal mistake of naming Malcolm, Prince of Cumberland, bottom of this page, line 37, we will establish our estate upon our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. Uh, and... Uh, 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 as we learn from Macbeth at line 48, you know, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap. That is, uh, until Duncan names Malcolm effectively the heir apparent, Macbeth could reasonably expect that he might be the next king because it's going to be an election uh, and the thanes are going to choose he has high honors among the thanes here. He's emerging as the greatest of the Scottish soldiers, and so maybe he could get to the throne legitimately. This is a... Now, you can say that Duncan is worried already about that, and if he wants his son to succeed him, uh, he'd better give him some leg up here. Uh, but Duncan really takes away his best tool for managing the situation by trying to name his son the heir apparent here. Uh, as long as Duncan played it coy, men like Macbeth, and for that matter, Banquo and Macduff could say, all right, well, I've got a shot at King uh, in the next election. Uh, but once Duncan tries to establish a dynasty here, uh, he's in real trouble. If you go back to page uh, uh, 76, uh, you'll see that England is presented as having a settled monarchy, a settled succession. This is Act 4, Scene 3, Line 155. Uh, this is said of Edward the Confessor and is spoken to the succeeding royalty. He leaves the healing benediction here. The images again and again here are of England as having a settled monarchy, but Scotland is a much more fluid, we would say medieval or feudal situation. Uh, and so Duncan uh, uh, miscalculates here, almost pushes uh, Macbeth into murdering him. Now, there's, there's one fabulous passage in the source that's not in the signet excerpts. Uh, you can read, uh, there are separate editions of Holland's Head's uh, uh, Chronicles, and there's actually a wonderful eight-volume set edited by Geoffrey Bullock called Narrative and Dramatic Sources of Shakespeare's Plays. And this is from this, but I, <laughs> I really fell out of my seat when I read this passage. Uh, in Holland's head, uh, McDowell, one of the rebels, says this of Duncan. He calls Duncan, and I quote, a faint-hearted milksop, more meet to govern a sort of idle monks in some cloister than to have the rule of such valiant and hardy men of war as the Scots were. I mean, Shakespeare must have just lit up when he saw that. Uh, I mean, there it is, uh, a contrast between Christian and pagan, and the faint-hearted milksop, uh, fit to govern a sort of idle monks in some cloister, versus the Scots, such valiant and hardy men of war as the Scots were. Now, the amazing thing is Shakespeare had written these lines uh, probably uh, 15 years before he read this passage. Uh, I'm going to quote you something from the second part of Henry VI. These are, uh, the Henry VI plays may be the very first thing uh, Shakespeare wrote. Uh, 
they deal with the events that happen, obviously, after Henry V. But Shakespeare had already written that story that leads up. There's three Henry VI plays, and then Richard III, the fourth play in that first tetralogy. But this is what York uh, says of Henry VI. You know, the War of the Roses, the Yorks versus the Lancasters. Uh, 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 Henry VI is the last of the red-hot Lancasters. And York says this of Henry VI. That hand of thine doth not become a crown. Thy hand is made to grasp a palmer's staff, that's a pilgrim staff, and not to grace an awful princely scepter. That gold must round and girt these brows of mine, whose smile and frown, like to Achilles' spear, is able with the change to kill and cure. That's the exact contrast that Shakespeare later found in Holland's Head account. Uh, but Shakespeare had this English character, York, uh, uh, accusing Henry VI of being too Christian. Uh, uh, you're, you're not fit to carry a princely scepter because you should be carrying a pilgrim staff. And I, I handle it like Achilles' spear. Uh, again, this is one of the earliest points I found in Shakespeare where he's working out the contrast between the classical or pagan and the Christian. Indeed, uh, Macbeth returns to the earliest ground in Shakespeare, uh, the contrast between Henry VI and Richard III uh, is the contrast between Duncan and Macbeth. Uh, and we can't do everything in this class, but I'm trying to give you an outline so you can study more of Shakespeare in your lifetime. But Sh Richard III is Shakespeare's first portrait of the anti-Christian tyrant, although Richard III masquerades as a holy man, and uh, Macbeth is a more subtle uh, and developed uh, uh, contrast. So it's you know looking at Duncan in the play, you see what happens when the king isn't warlike by disposition when the king has been so gospeled uh, and so brought under humane statute that he literally has to say, what bloody man is that when he sees a soldier? Just doesn't have a feel uh, for it uh, and, and doesn't cut it as a king, especially in a world uh, as savage as Shakespeare presents Scotland, where again, in our opening glimpse, one guy is cutting another guy in half while everybody else stands around and applauds. Uh, so it really, the, the story of Duncan is really fascinating. Uh, uh, again, I think people don't explore enough the implications of that. Now we're gonna come to Malcolm next time uh, and see how uh, Duncan's son learns something from this whole experience and maybe does try to provide that synthesis between clemency and cruelty that his father could not. And we'll particularly look at that scene uh, with uh, uh, Macduff uh, in Act Four. Uh, uh, Malcolm becomes a very interesting figure when you start to think of him as analyzing the defects of his father's uh, rule and why his father got himself killed. Uh, so, all right. Let's now talk more about uh, Macbeth. Because uh, what I want to talk about, what I've been trying to show you here is, is you know, here's this, this pagan warrior uh, who's been Christianized. He's now living in a Christian uh, society. He's doing well in it the way Othello does well in Venice. Uh, you know, Duncan could not defend himself against the Norwegians the way Venice can't defend itself against the Turks. Uh, uh, so the, the Venetians hire Othello, they buy themselves a Turk as they see it, uh, and uh, 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 Duncan's lucky he's got a pagan warrior as a cousin, and, and Macbeth uh, can save his royal butt uh, against the Kerns and Gallo glasses. Uh, but what we see in this play uh, is what happens to this heroic figure when there's an enormous eruption of the supernatural in his life. Uh, and that's what happens when these uh, witches come to him making prophecies, uh, the famous prophecies about uh, his future, uh, that uh, he'll become Thane of Gloms and then uh, Thane of Corder, uh, and then he'll become uh, a king. Uh, this transforms the man. Uh, now, it, uh, 
these witches, uh, these weird sisters, are presented as themselves sort of pagan figures. Weird is a, a Norse word that, that means fate, uh, the sisters of fate. Uh, but what I want to argue is that what we're seeing in them, nevertheless, is an image of the supernatural, whatever else uh, you say about it. Uh, they are a kind of demonic parody of Christianity, just as Iago is a kind of demonic parody of a priest. Uh, the intense relationship between Iago and Othello is on the model of a priest and uh, a man whom he is both confessing and catechizing. Uh, as we saw in a weird way, Iago teaches a form of Christianity to Othello about the uh, transitoriness of reputation, about the corruption in politics, and above all about the sinfulness of human beings, the inner corruption that they harbor, and that's what unhinges Othello. Uh, in uh, uh, Macbeth, uh, he gets taught a lesson in providence. Hamlet said there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. In this play, we see there's a special providence in the fall of a king. Uh, that is, Macbeth is taught uh, that things are fated, F-A-T-E-D, in the world, uh, and that he can go along with that uh, to uh, his own profit. Uh, uh, what's interesting is to see the transformation, again, from the beginning, Back on page four, the first thing we learn of Macbeth, uh, this is again act one, scene two, about line 17, is that he is disdaining fortune. Brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune. Now this is something we saw in Coriolanus, and again, do remember Coriolanus is written after this play, and I've set the things, the plays up in what I'm calling a kind of logical uh, order. But the classical hero disdains fortune. Uh, that's what his bravery means. Uh, he goes into battle uh, with the understanding that he may lose. Uh, and that is what makes him uh, courageous. Uh, but uh, with uh, uh, Macbeth, uh, we get a very different uh, attitude uh, uh, develop. Uh, and... Uh, uh, let's see if I can find the passage where uh, uh, I think it's Act 3 well let's start in Act 1 anyway with the, the transformation that he undergoes uh, just look at how he thinks about the uh, murder of Duncan uh, uh, this is uh, uh, on page 20, it's perhaps his most famous soliloquy. Uh, so act one, scene seven. Uh, if it were done when it is done, then it were, well it were done quickly. If the assassination could travel up, travel up the consequence and catch with this or see success, that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. Uh, now, uh, this is a great soliloquy, and indeed, we're in the world of soliloquy. Uh, I've been making this contrast between a pagan hero like Coriolanus, who doesn't have much inside him, and have these figures like Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, they have such internal depths. Nietzsche says in the Genealogy of Morals, uh, Christianity made man interesting. And Nietzsche is famous for you know, writing a book called The Antichrist and being thought of as anti-Christian. And yet he says, Christianity made man interesting. And you can see it here that Shakespeare's Christian heroes have so much more depth. Uh, there's so much more tension uh, within them. Uh, and uh, notice uh, the issue here, though. What's on his mind? The life to come. Uh, what he's... Uh, uh, focusing on is just what we saw uh, uh, Hamlet focusing on uh, the issue of his eternal soul. Uh, now he seems to be saying he'll skip it. 
That is, he's saying, if this assassination could be done quickly, if it could be done in such a way uh, as uh, it could limit the consequences, then he'll do it. Uh, he won't worry about the life to come. But actually, when you analyze it, uh, you see that what he's really trying to do is achieve the life to come here and now in this world. Uh, and that's, I'm going to offer as the formula for what uh, Christianity does in distorting uh, Macbeth's impulses. That is, what he wants is the be-all and the end-all. Uh, he wants something infinite uh, here. That, that's what the afterlife is supposed to be. Uh, it's supposed to be the, uh, uh, the be-all and the end-all. Those are, those are terms that describe something ultimate something absolute. Uh, but he's going to look for a blow that might be the be-all and the end-all here. That's what attracts him to the, old the whole idea of, this, of the kingship here. He imagines the kingship as something that will give him everything he wants. Uh, in a way, the uh, uh, witches have seduced him uh, uh, into this uh, to make him think that Everything will be fulfilled uh, if he can have that kingship. And moreover, what he wants to do is to find it uh, in an unshakable form. So that if you turn to page 42, Act 3, Scene 1, uh, about line 47, uh, now he's thinking about uh, Banquo. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. If you contemplate that line, to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus, you will see what's distinctive about Macbeth as a hero and very unclassical. You cannot imagine Coriolanus saying to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. There's something almost cowardly about that claim. Uh, the classical hero lives a life of danger. Uh, that's what defines him is his courage in the face of danger and the courage in the face of his own mortality. Again, here, Homer's Achilles is the great example of that. Coriolanus is in many ways a recreation of that. We've talked about the absence of the afterlife in Coriolanus and in Shakespeare's Republic in Rome and in the absence of the thought of the afterlife, at least an uh, afterlife anyone would want to live. Uh, uh, it takes courage to risk your life uh, knowing there's nothing desirable beyond this world. Uh, Macbeth, like Hamlet, like Othello, very much lives in a Christian world of heaven and hell and in which therefore there is something very potentially attractive about an afterlife and moreover in which now he wants his achievement secure. Uh, uh, he does not like the classical world. Now again, I'm saying he's a pagan, but he's been sufficiently exposed to Christianity to have developed a kind of Christian critique of the ancient world so that, page 94, uh, Act 5, Scene 8, why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. I've quoted this line several times uh, in the course because I knew it was coming. Uh, but you, you see the distinction here. He thinks of those Roman heroes as fools. Uh, they kill themselves uh, when they could be uh, fighting along uh, in the hopes of getting everything. Uh, uh, and that's Macbeth's sense here. Uh, it's what draws him into this cycle of crimes. And what's so powerful about this play uh, is... The, the logic of Macbeth's criminality here. Uh, uh, again, think about it. The murder of Duncan is supposed to be the be-all or the end-all. Kill this man and you've got everything. But it doesn't turn out to be true. Uh, indeed, uh, there's a fascinating page, on page 34, I'm always trying to suggest things to actors, uh, but uh, this is Act 2, Scene 3. This is Macbeth with what is undoubtedly a prepared speech 
when Duncan's dead body is discovered. This is page 34, Act 2, Scene 3, line 93. Uh, had I but died an hour before this chance, had I lived a blessed, I had lived a blessed time. Uh, for from this instant, there's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renowned Grace is dead. If I were doing this, and uh, I would have Macbeth start this as if it was a rhetorical prepared speech. You know, he's got to cover the fact that he's the murderer, and so he's got to seem really shocked that Duncan's dead and, 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 and regret it. But I would have him realize as he was speaking that he is speaking a deep truth here. You know, again, I'm no Ian McKellen. Uh, uh, you know, had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time, for from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality, all is but toys, renown, and grace is dead, the wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees has left this vault to brag. You see what I'm saying? You could do it so that even in speaking the lines, he realized that what he made up was true. You know, the expectation here, we killed Duncan, I'm king, it, it, it's, it's what was predicted, we got to do it. Uh, 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 and then he realizes, no, there's Banquo. Uh, uh, I'm promised the kingship, but the weird sisters promised Banquo he'd found the line of kings. So that's what gets us to page 42. Uh, uh, again, Act 3, Scene 1. To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Uh, and then our fears in Banquo stick deep. Uh, uh, and, and now we learn uh, uh, the line 54, there is none but he whose being I do fear. And under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said, Mark Antony's was by Caesar. It's fascinating. Shakespeare seems to be thinking ahead to Antony and Cleopatra's point. He chid the sisters when first they put the name upon me. Uh, they, hailed upon, they hailed him father to a line of kings. See, that's what upsets it. And notice, uh, and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlittle hand, no son of mine is succeeding. If it be so for Banquo's issue, have I filed my mind? For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace, only for them and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man. Uh, again, this is a, this pagan warrior who now has a Christian conscience, uh, uh, a Christian fear of damnation, uh, uh, but also this Christian longing for something absolute uh, that will give him uh, everything that... Uh, 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 he desires. Uh, look at page 82. Uh, this is in Lady Macbeth's Sleepwalking, which we'll come back to, but Act 5, Scene 1, Line 40. A soldier and a feared. That's the paradox I want you to see that Shakespeare develops in this play. Uh, a soldier and a feared. Macbeth begins as a fearless soldier. Uh, the pagan warrior in the proper pagan uh, setting, namely the battlefield. But once he turns that <coughs> pagan murderousness inward and kills Duncan, he enters the domestic world the way Othello did. Uh, it's where Hamlet began. Uh, and suddenly everything becomes distorted for him. And this man who is chiefly characterized by his fearlessness to begin with, now suddenly becomes a fear. Now, Lady Macbeth uh, sends this. This is page 16. Uh, so Act 1, Scene 5. Uh, uh, she's all excited. She gets this letter about the promise uh, from the weird sisters. Gloms thou art. So Act 1, Scene 5, about line 16. Gloms thou art in quarter, and shalt be when thou art promised. Shalt, shalt be what thou art promised. Yet I do, do I fear thy nature. <coughs> it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Now that's odd. We thought Duncan is meek and filled with the milk of human kindness, but Lady Macbeth sees it's in Macbeth as well. And again, these tragedies are filled with hybrid creatures. Uh, Hamlet, uh, uh, the very complex, intelligent, sensitive, uh, Renaissance humanist and scholar who nevertheless has this streak of classical fierceness in him and ends up killing half the people in the play. And Macbeth, this pagan warrior who nevertheless has the milk of human kindness in him. Uh, to continue, thou wouldst be great, 
art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. And there you see all the complexity we've been seeing this course about uh, ambition. Uh, uh, ambition, which is a virtue in the ancient pagan world. Uh, it's seen as an illness in the Christian world. Pride is a sin. Uh, and yet it's still there. You never get rid of the thumos. And the question is, what happens now uh, in the Christian world is going to have a form of uh, 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 illness uh, to it. And that's that, again, in Hamlet, the currents turn awry. Again, we're seeing in this play the currents turn awry, that there's something twisted in Macbeth when he combines uh, the soul of a pagan, well, <laughs> uh, the spirit of a pagan warrior with the soul uh, of, of a Christian theater. Uh, so, uh, 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 again, this man who was fearless now is saying he fears Banquo. So he's drawn further into this tragedy uh, when he uh, plots to have Banquo uh, and Fleance murdered. And notice his reaction. Uh, to that. This is page 51. When the murderers come back uh, uh, with the report. Uh, this is Act 3. This is page 51, Act 3, Scene 4, about line 21. Uh, when you know, things are going great, uh, Banquo's dead, but then Macbeth hears that Flance has escaped. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabin, crib, confined, bound in to saucy doubts and fears. What I want you to see there is this is a quest for perfection. Remember Othello, my perfect soul? Uh, 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 remember Hamlet, uh, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were not that I have bad dreams. Uh, uh, the imagery is so similar among these three char characters. Uh, Othello's obsession with Desdemona as alabaster. Uh, uh, the, what comes along with the, the Christianity here is the dream of something perfect. You know, uh, what we have, this is the same all or nothing attitude I've been trying to show you in Hamlet and Othello a kind of absolutizing the world. Uh, uh, in Hamlet and Othello, it shows up chiefly in their attitude towards women, uh, that they, they are either angels or whores, uh, and they can't find a middle ground. Uh, a Macbeth fa can't find a middle ground here. He wants a perfect world that is founded as the rock, uh, founded on a deep foundation, and in the absence of perfection, he has nothing. His cabin, crib, confined, bound to saucy, saucy doubts and fears. Uh, uh, and again, this is the logic that drives him. Uh, you know, first, uh, kill, kill Duncan and I'll have it all. Gee, I don't have anything. Well, the only problem is Banquo and Fleance. If I kill them, I'll have it all. But no, he kills. First of all, they don't kill Fleance, and still he, he doesn't get it all. Uh, this attitude persists throughout the play for him. If you look uh, as far into it as 86, this is Act 5, Scene 3, about line 20. This push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. And this is his absolutism I'm talking about uh, with him. Uh, 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 he's constantly questing for the absolute act uh, that will give him everything he desires. And of course, the sad thing about it is that it gives him nothing that he desires. Uh, that it is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the saddest uh, feature of the... Uh, uh, logic of the play, again, of the all-or-nothing logic. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, I'm trying to, the, uh, uh, the line, Nort, this is, yeah, it's page 46. Lady Macbeth picks up on this. Uh, uh, Act 3, scene 2, uh, line 
for naught's had all spent where desire is got without content, tis safer be, to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. Again, none of this middle ground. The issue is safety. There's, uh, th this is very anachronistic, but let me just say there's something almost middle class about their attitudes, that they become more concerned with safety than with honor and nobility and courage. Uh, again, this obsession with safety, with eliminating any possible threat. Uh, 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 and again, the paradox that you, uh, uh, that you have to have it all or you have nothing. Or again, the notion of doubtful joy. All three of these characters, this Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth, are haunted by forms of doubt. Uh, skepticism. And again, <laughs> Coriolanus had no doubts. It's the advantage of being a big thug who can beat up 40 people at a time. You know, what we're really seeing here is a marvelous contrast between uh, what I'll call the kind of primary notion of the hero and these intensely complex heroes that Shakespeare develops. Uh, uh, almost all people have a legend of a strong guy. Uh, it's Achilles in among the Greeks, it's Samson in the Old Testament. Uh, almost all peoples have epic stories of giants. And the primary the image of the hero is a guy who can beat up 40 people. Uh, so again, a wonderful aphorism in Nietzsche where, where he says, uh, uh, ask a child if he would like to be more virtuous than his playmates, and he will stare at you in incomprehension. Ask him if he'd like to be stronger than his playmates and watch his eyes light up. And that is the, the, you know, the primary childlike sense of the heroic. It's, it's, it's there in our superheroes. Uh, it's why we dream of superheroes in our culture to this day. There's a kind of primary image uh, of the, the hero, the superhero, which is basically, my father can beat up your father. It's a very simple notion of heroism. Uh, but it is enduring, and we never lose touch of it, and that's why we go to sports events uh, and sit there for three hours in the cold watching two idiot teams trying desperately to lose the game until one of them ekes out a victory in the end. Uh, and we love it, because you know, we, we, we triumph. Uh, but you know, uh, these, these heroes like Hamlet, Macbeth, and Othello, they're so much more complex. Uh, because you know they, they know something about that. Uh, a fellow remembers, you know, there's a day when I could have beaten 20 of you, uh, and Hamlet says I can beat him at the odds. You know, he's willing to take the handicap. And Macbeth, you know, is used to being praised for cutting people in half, but then they get into situations, as we say in New Jersey. Uh, they they get into difficult situations, uh, and it doesn't turn anymore on whether you can beat up 40 people or not. Now again, I don't ever want to denigrate Coriolanus or Achilles or that understanding of the heroic, which is very much related to the military needs of humanity and the fact that we, to this day, need heroes like that. Uh, 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 on the other hand, you know what, what makes Shakespeare such a great dramatist is that he introduces us to this incredible complexity when you ask one of these heroes to think and to make moral judgments. Uh, and again, that's, uh, you know, I, I started with Macbeth as this fighting machine. He's a man who, you know, by instinct almost cuts people in half. Uh, uh, but he's actually, in many ways, <laughs> very thoughtful. Uh, you know, his wife says he's got too much of the milk of human kindness in it. Uh, in him, and so he's faced with situations uh, where the outcome isn't as clear cut, and especially when he wants perfection. Now, uh, it's so much easier and clear cut uh, in the world of the Roman plays. Generally, uh, you might think about that. Just the difference uh, uh, in in the Roman plays, uh, the death. The triumph of, well, the killing of one person and another almost always occurs in a battle scene. The assassination of Caesar is an exception to that, and it's why it's so morally uh, complex. But generally, 
uh, the notion in the Roman plays in this pagan world, this ancient classical world, uh, is that two heroes face each other on the battlefield as Hector and Achilles face each other. Notice in these three plays, we're dealing with murder. The battle between Hamlet and Fortinbras is in the distant past, the elder Hamlet and the elder Fortinbras. Uh, we're in such a more, a darker world now. The Roman plays take place in daylight because uh, everything's transparent in a way. The heroes meet on the battlefield. Uh, even, the, even the assassination of Caesar takes place in a public, public spot. Uh, these plays take place at night. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, Macbeth is dominated by night, and clearly the imagery is at night. Uh, uh, Hamlet as well, and even Othello. Othello carries in a candle just to see Desdemona when he's going to murder her. Uh, there's something so much darker about these plays. It's the paradigm. I mean, Christianity brings a new light to the world, but it introduces a new kind of evil. Uh, this internal evil. Again, we're in the Roman plays, we're in the world of, of Nietzsche's mass morality. It's a world of good and bad. In what I'm just going to very gingerly call these Christian plays, we're in a world of good and evil now. Uh, uh, ca characters like uh, Iago uh, or Claudius or in a way Macbeth, and certainly we would say the Weird Sisters, they're evil uh, in a way that really nobody in the Roman plays is evil. Maybe Ophidius, but he, because he's kind of ma Machiavellian and scheming, but even he is, you know, forthright and forthcoming compared to Iago. In other words, when we, it's sort of we enter the world uh, of the devil in these plays. Uh, uh, and the demonic and the devilish. Uh, there are these new internal depths, but they often hide corruption. And so these plays are much more about evil. Uh, indeed, evil is the heart of these plays. In fact, uh, Macbeth is fundamentally about transforming a pagan hero into someone who's evil. How we get from brave Macbeth in the first scene to the dead butcher and his fiend-like queen. That's the great transformation that occurs here. And it's a kind of corruption by supernatural forces which gets him to strive for such a perfection that he becomes a murdering machine. Well, I gotta stop here. We'll continue with this uh, week from today. Have a great Thanksgiving uh, and we'll see you afterwards.